love this week. I love this week because it's filled with hope, because we just had Christmas, it's right before the new year, and you take that time to evaluate, how has the year been? What's next year gonna look like? Set some goals, set some aspirations, set some plans, because we are supposed to plan, right? I'm not somebody who's really big on resolutions for the new year, but I'm big on saying, where did we come from, where are we now, and where are we going? I like that part of it. What, are, what is God calling you to do this year? What is God calling for our church this year? What does that look like? It's just a time of hope and renewal. Uh, Span is a time of naps. The week between Christmas and New Year's, I don't normally have to work, so I can take naps. So it's good all around. It's good for your body. It's good for your soul. It's good for your spirit. It's a good time to be alive, isn't it? It is. So this year, instead of making the resolutions, I'm looking at things a little differently. And in that time of evaluation for my life and also for the church, I believe that what we're doing is it's a restoration resolution. Because restoration in the worldly sense is to give, get back what somebody stole, right? To, to fix something that has been that was once new, now it was messed up, and now we're gonna to try to get it back to where it was originally. But in the world standards, that never really happens. It doesn't happen. If you restore an old car, it's not like it was when it was here originally. If you restore a piece of furniture, it's not in the same state that it was. It's like, it's okay, but it's a little bit less, right? But in God's standard, and we're going to look at this today with God's godly restoration. Not only do you get back what was lost, but then it's over and above. It is more than. By the end of today, you will be glad to know about the things, to evaluate and to figure out the things that you've lost. Because it means that not only are those things coming back, but they're coming back in quantity or in quality. Because that's how God does things. That's how, you're, that's how much your God loves you. That's how much he loves us. It's to get back and add on top of it. Doesn't that sound like God? That sounds like God. That sounds like our loving Savior. We're not talking about the incomplete restoration. So this attitude of restoration. Let's look at the Bible. That's always a good place to start. In Exodus, Exodus 22, 1, it says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall receive five oxen for an ox or four sheep for a sheep. Don't go to sleep. This is good. It sounds boring because who here owns ox or sheep? Anyone? No. But it's still relevant for you today because if you look at this, if so if you lose an ox, you will receive five ox for one ox or four sheep for one sheep. Does that doesn't make sense? Like that math doesn't work out, right? Why would you get five for one or four for one? Well, I think the Bible's trying to tell us that the greater the loss, the greater the reward. Because an ox is bigger than a sheep, right? Like I'm not a farmer, but I feel like I read somewhere that an ox is bigger than a sheep. So the, if you have something really bad that happened to you, or if you had something that was taken from you that was so important to you, then take hope. Because the, the worse it was, the better you're going to turn out. Because that's how much our God loves us. And this was in the time, this was man's law. This was law that the man had to follow, and it wasn't even the recompense that God paid. But it was a type and shadow of what's happening for us now today. The greater the loss the greater the restoration in God. Not in the world, but in God. It is the attitude of much, much more. Next scripture, Isaiah 42, 22. Sounds boring, but it gets better. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey and no one delivers. Here's the good part, are you ready? The, no one delivers for plunder and no one says restore. This is not who we are now. To, tell, to claim restoration, you have to say that you have been wronged. You have to acknowledge that there has been a loss. And then you have to claim restore. This is what I'm going to do, at least for the beginning of this year. 
when something happens that is taken from me or something that looks like it's not good for me, I'm just going to declare restore. Because what we're, what we're going to learn today is how meaningful and how powerful that word is. So it doesn't even have to be because sometimes, you know, it's not convenient to have a long 10-hour prayer. It's also not normally beneficent for us to have a long 10-hour prayer because normally when we pray, Jesus gave us example of prayer, right? And the example of prayer was not that you would have to pray for long times and break through. And it, Jesus prayed very short prayers. He declared and he said, this is, hey, you're blind, see. You're sick, be healed. It was not the long hours and hours in prayer. So one of the things to do this year, check your prayer life. Make sure that you're not praying doubt and unbelief. And for me, one of the ways I'm getting around it is I'm, I break it down. I'm a, I'm a simple person. Restore. Whatever I've lost, restore. Oh, I feel a headache coming on. Mm, restore. Oh, I feel mm, restore. Oh, the light bill's extra <laughs> this month restore. Whatever is trying to be taken from me, I'm not even spending time, my valuable time, wasting it on, well, what, wonder why, wonder what, wonder, mm -mm. restore, restore. Because God restores what? In quantity or in quality or both. I don't care what you lost. I don't care what it was that you lost last year or two years ago or three years ago or four years ago. It may have seemed something that just knocked the wind right out of you. And it, it, you know, the holidays sometimes are not as bright and cheery as what they are on the Hallmark Channel. And sometimes they come with a lot of emotion. And sometimes they come with a lot of sadness. And sometimes it's a time to reflect of what you had, but then also it's time to see, feel what you lost. But you know what? God, God is not, God is not held by what? God is a God of restoration. God is not held by, oh, this thing happened and we didn't expect it, and so therefore, how are we going to continue and how are we going to live on? He is not concerned with that. He had a plan before the beginning of the world. He had a plan before you were made about how to restore what you lost. So if you, this holiday was not exciting and happy for you, restore. God's here to restore whatever it was. God's here to restore and to make new and to make better. We are going to fill us ourselves with hope today. In Zechariah 9, 12 in the Amplified Version, it says, Return to the stronghold of security and prosperity, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will restore double your former prosperity to you. Even today. Even today. It started before you ever had the problem, which means it's already in the works. Whether you see it right now or not is completely irrelevant. Because the things that we see are temporary, but the things that we do not see are eternal. So if you, don't, if you see it, it can be changed. So we're saying hopeful. We will never give up hope. We are no longer hopeless. We are, and I like how the Bible says it, you are prisoners of hope. Hope meaning not a hope and a prayer, like we don't know what it is that's going to happen. Oh, are you going to have a good year? I hope so. No, we're Christians. Hope to us means a confident expectation of good. So if you ask me if my year is going to be good and I say I hope so, that doesn't mean that I'm just throwing up a prayer and, like the lottery and hoping that it works. No, it is I have a confident expectation of good. I have hope. I'm a prisoner of hope. I do not believe that this year, I don't care what the media says. I don't care what variant comes out. I don't care what the doctor has told me. I don't care what my checkbook says. I'm a prisoner of hope. I have a confident expectation of good. So if I say I hope so, know that that carries weight when I say it, and it carries weight when you say it, because we are prisoners of hope. And the Bible says, I will restore double your former prosperity to you. So let's talk about some things that he can restore. Let's talk about just, because anything that was lost can be restored. 
Any relationship that was lost can be restored. Any person that was lost can be restored in quantity or quality. Even if you had a terrible childhood, did you know? One of my dad's favorite sayings was, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And that was funny because he acted like a child pretty much until the day that he went to heaven. But it was also true because you know what? That time, those times that you may have lost out because maybe you didn't have a good childhood, you didn't have a good home life, you know, as you go through your life and you live, just because you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old does not mean that you cannot have people that come into your life that give you some of the, those things that you lost, those things that were never available to you. It's, you're, if you're still breathing, if you're still on this side of the dirt, you have time because we are prisoners of hope and it says, I will restore double your former prosperity to you. That's what the Bible says. So what can he restore? Let's look at Joel. 225 or 27. Hey, you know how I tell you the answers to everything? The answers are in orange today. Okay? So look for the orange. So today, I so I will restore to you the years. So the first one is the years. I will restore to you the years that the swarm, swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my army, my great army, which I sent to you. We're not going to talk about the great army which I sent to you because now we're living in New Testament, not Old Testament, so God no longer sends locusts or plagues or corona or cancer to teach his people, okay? He will restore the years. Do you, has anyone here ever felt like they're too old? Don't answer. Don't answer. This is rhetorical. So I was talking to Nick this morning. I turned 50 this year. 50. 50. Half of a century, 50. There's some things that I thought when I was 20 that I would have done before I was 50, and they have not happened yet. There are things that I've done before I was 50 that if you'd asked me if I would have done when I was 20, I'd have been like, absolutely not. So it works both ways. However, it takes, it's like that new year, right? Where are we? What have we been doing? Did I lose time? Was I supposed to do this, that, and the other when I was 25? Have I lost out on some things? Now, I'm going to tell you, I probably at this age cannot be a ballerina. However, I can do what God called me to do here. I was not called to be a ballerina. For this time in my life, I was called to be the pastor of this church. And I can do that, and I can prepare for that even now in the midst. So if I'm worried that I'm too old and my mind is not working, well, guess what? I can have the mind of a 20-year-old with the wisdom of a 50 year old. Now tell me that's not, that's a winning combination. Be prepared to see some good things out of my mouth this year, because that's my declaration right there. Oh, let's continue. So you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Oh, that was this, that, that's a Christmas scripture. <laughs> you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. I was praising God for that brisket that I ate. Who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Isn't that interesting that he says it twice? He didn't forget the first time. He wanted us to know, to emphasize. Many times the Bible says that. If you read in the Bible and it says, verily, verily, you better pay attention. My son, attend to my words. My people will never be put to shame. My people will never be put to shame. It is not too late. You can still step out. You can still do the thing that God told you to do. Many of the things that we, when we know what we're supposed to do, and we think, oh my, am I too old to do it? Is it too late to do it? One of the reasons why we stop ourselves, in my opinion, in Kim's opinion, is because we're worried that we're going to look like idiots. And that they're going to be like, oh, that girl, what's she trying to do up there? Acting like she's so young. Acting like she's not, like she was supposed to be doing this. Maybe if she was 30, she could have done it. Maybe if she was 20, she could have done it. Maybe if she was 70. Because did you know that it works on both ways? For some people, I'm young to be doing what I'm doing. And for other people, I started really late. But for God, it was exactly on time. But that's not just true of me. It's true of you. When you're working in God's will and with God's timing, it doesn't always make sense with the world. So if you're worried that you're going to look like an idiot and you're going to be ashamed of what happens when you step out, well, God's people will never be put to shame. He will never be put to shame. You just got to like throw your head up, put your shoulders back and just go forward and not look at the people that are beside you 
sitting there on their butts, way giving their finger in judgment about you. It's easy to judge from the sidelines. It's easy to be the armchair quarterback. When you're not the one who's in battle, when you're not the one who's out there doing it, it's easy. But those are not the people that you take encouragement or instruction from. You're taking instruction from God. It's pretty easy. And he will lead you with every step of the way, no matter when you start. So, number one, we have the years. Oh, wonder what number two is. Oh, it's good news. Because in Jeremiah 30, 17, it says, I will give you back your health and heal your wounds, says the Lord, for you are called an outcast, Jerusalem, for whom nobody cares. Aw, look at that. When you're sick, don't you kind of feel that way? Like you're just an outcast. You've got to stay home, especially with this in particular virus that, that they're talking about right now. You've got to quarantine. You've got to stay away from everybody. I'm not suggesting that you don't. But I'm saying, when you are isolating because of where you are, because of a sickness or because of a disease, it's very easy to get into, oh, I'm just an outcast. No one can come near me. Whatever it is, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, we don't need to act like we have something wrong with us that God was not, didn't already pay for. It doesn't matter what it is. It's interesting, the word wounds there, and when you go back to the original, it, is, it specifically talks, to, it talks about that wounds is chronic problems. A lot of us in here have had corona, and one of the things that seems so scary is they say, well, if you had it, then you can have long-term effects from it, especially if you have some of these other factors. Some of us have been diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, problems that are supposed to be lifelong problems. You may be sitting there thinking, oh, you know what? I actually don't have a, as good of a memory as what I used to. Maybe I have dementia. Maybe I have Alzheimer's. Those are lifelong chronic problems. This specific scripture says, I will heal your lifelong chronic problems. You don't have to worry about that. Oh, you think you need to be on medication for the rest of your life? That's what your doctor said? Thank you for your opinion. I appreciate that. But see, my God is a God who heals. Amen. I am not saying do not take your medication. That's between you and Jesus, and you need to get the wisdom of God and a plan from him and talk with your doctor. But I'm just saying, the doctor's not the last word. When they dole out a prescription, that does not mean that you have to be on it for the rest of your life. And it may be part of a healing plan for you to be on it temporarily until you kind of pick yourself up, get yourself filled up, and then you move on in the wisdom of God. But you don't have to be worried by some of these things because one of the things that normally happens with age is the sicknesses start to come around. Oh, the arthritis starts to come. Oh, well, that's just normal. No, that's not normal for you. That does not have to be your normal. You decide what your normal is. We have ad extremely active people that are into, in, they're living in their retirement right now. More active than people that I know that are working. And it's happening in our church. And it's happening in our church because we preach no condemnation here. We preach that you are God's favorite. You are the chosen people of God that he loves so much, and you don't have to live by the world's standards. You don't have to say, well, now I'm 110 years old. Must be time for me to start taking naps during the day. If you want to take a nap, take a nap. But not because the world tells you you have to. Oh, now I'm too old. I can't write that book that I was supposed to write. No. No. That's just what the world says. That's not what God says. Because God says he's going to restore the years and he's going to keep you healthy. So really, what, what could you have lost? Nothing, nothing, because of what you believe, because you're the one who says, oh, wait, no, no. Maybe I was called to do it when I was 40, but now I'm 50, and I'm actually paying attention now. So you know what, God, you're bigger than this. Restore, restore, restore. Ah, oh, this is a good one. In Psalm 23, it says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What's your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Mm. 
your mind, your will, your emotions. So we have our body, we have the years, now we have our mind, our will, and our emotions. Because emotions are fickle. We don't need to be moved by them, right? We need to have restoration. Did you know that you can create pathways in your head when something happens, then your emotions and your thoughts just automatically go someplace? A little neuro pathway. Did you know that you can recreate that? Even in the world, they can do that. But you can do it so easily with God. You've got to arrest that thought, arrest that thing that just happened in your head, arrest where your mind was about to take you and say, no, 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 no. And now you put a new destination. You put a new destination in your GPS, and that is, oh, no, no, he restores my soul. He restores my mind, my will, my emotions. I do not have to feel that way when something happens. I do not, ha- it's not, you're not like a dog. You know Pavlov's dog, when the bell rings and you've got to go out. You're not that person. Every time around Christmas, you don't have to gain 10 pounds. Every time in January, you don't have to feel bad because you stopped exercising week two. Every time when you see somebody or you see that number come up on your caller ID, you don't have to feel less than. That's not where you have to go. The only thing true is the word of God, and if it's not in the word of God, it can be changed. The reality of the situation is it's whatever you say about the word of God, because the word of God has been true since before you were born. And it's the word of God, it's the truth that you know that's going to set you free, which is why I like our church, because we're all about telling you the truth. We're not covering it up. We live in a fallen world. Things happen. And now, this is how we live. This is how you still live in heaven on earth, regardless of the fact that there's hell all around you. That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to be doing now. And that's what we do, because that's what we're called to do. Ah, Psalms. Psalms is a good one, right? Psalms 51.12 says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. The joy. He will restore joy to you. Happiness is based on your condition. Joy is based on who you are and who he said you are. Joy is a decision. It is not a feeling. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So if the devil can get your joy, he will get you weak. If you are sitting there and you are weak and you are tired all the time, check your joy. Check what, you're, check what you are paying attention to. Check what you are focusing on. Because my guess is it's not what's in the Bible, what the Bible says about you. It's what you say about you, what your mama said about you, what your ex-husband said about you. No, we're not going to do that. We are, the joy is the fuse to faith. You protect these things. These things are important. They're not options. If you... If the devil steals your joy and he gets you weak, then you're not going to win that battle because you're going to have, that faith is not going to be rising up inside you. You're just going to be, you can just be down and depressed and in anxiety because you know it is winter and the days are shorter, seasonal anxiety is coming. Keep claiming it, yeah. Or, or, or it's extra time for you to rest and to receive from the Lord what he has for you and what he says about you and what his word says about you. It's up to you what you do, but it's time today to get your joy back. Put whatever song you got to get on. Does everybody have a song? If you don't, you should get one. You got a good scripture. You got a song. Play whatever it is you got to play. Do whatever it is you got to do. Because today, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And tomorrow and the next day. We have to identify, though. We have to identify when the thief is there and he's taking something. Did you know I listened to, it was a popular pastor of a church, and he literally said the words, sometimes I don't know if something came from God or the devil. What? Whew. Okay. So there's a scripture in the Bible that says, John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and destroy, but I came that you would have life and life more abundantly. So if it relates to life and life more abundantly, then it's from God, and if it, re- if it is killing and stealing and destroying, if it is sickness, if it is disease, that did not come from God. That came from Satan. Okay, are we clear? Now you know more than this pastor knows. Aren't you excited? But you have to identify it to know whether it's right or wrong because it's do I accept it or do I resist it? That is up to us to decide. We have to run it through the sifter of the word. And if God gave it to you, then don't try to get rid of it. This is the thing that's confusing to me. So many people, not in our church, say, oh, well, God gave me this sickness. God put corona on me to slow me down. No, he did not. Mm -mm. 
No, because does corona fall under sickness and disease? Yes, it does. Is it life and life more abundantly? No, it's not. So is it from God or is it from the devil? He doesn't have it to give. He does not have sickness. He does not have disease. He's not teaching his people like that. You would go to jail if my sister Chris gave Julia her daughter corona on purpose. She would go to jail. But we talked about God like this? That is sad. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. So what we're going to do, Proverbs 6, 30 through 31 says, people do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet, when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all substance of his house. So it doesn't even matter why the thing came. You have to identify that someone stole it from you. For clarity, the flood that happened downstairs was not from God. It was from Satan. That was things that were stolen from us. Not only will we get back what we had, but we will get back more. And that will happen this year. Because the little room that we think we're in a little room now, we had, it looked bigger downstairs, right? Square footage, we had more room downstairs. And now for temporary purposes, we're all in the same small room. But we have a scripture. What was stolen has to be returned and above. So we're not just looking for a place in quantity or quality that was what we had. If it's that, then that's not from God. It is a place in quantity or and or quality that we are going to, and that's just a physical thing. That's just a physical thing. That's not even talking about some of the, the, the emotions that came with that flood or some of the things that happened when we moved up here. Those things as well have to be restored and back again. But you have to say, that was not from God. That was not from God. That separation was not from God. But now we are due because that's what the Bible says. Do not blame God for the devil's work. This year, I feel that it is, it is, it, we are as if we are the Israelites going into the promised land. Because... We have promises about where this church specifically is going and where we're going as a body of Christ. And when that happens, when you're going through the tough times, God is there for you. Much like with the Israelites, he protected them, he heated them, he cooled them, he gave them manna every day. But once they were in the promised land, they no longer needed that provision on a daily basis because they're in the promised land. In Joshua 5, 12, it says, then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. That is the food from the promised land. As good as manna, I'm sure, was, they now had everything available to them that God had provided to them through the promised land. And that's where we're entering in this year, if you, if you know it and if you claim it. If you say, well, this is just, if good enough is good enough, then good enough will just keep being good enough for you. You don't ever have to, you know... Salvation, in its one form, is that you're not going to go to hell. And that's great and that's wonderful. But if you live hell here on earth, then really, it's great to have your fire insurance, as they like to call it. But, but why? What good is it for you here unless you find out who it is that you are and what you're supposed to be doing and what God has provided for you and then start reaping the benefits of those promises? There are benefits to being a child of God. There are benefits to being heir of the kingdom. And when the bad things come and the bad things happen, there are even benefits to that because of who you are. When the things happen that come and take your stuff, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Because now, now not only am I getting that back, but now it is over and above what I lost. God restores. You, in Psalm 71, 20 through 21, it says, You have allowed me to suffer much hardships, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore to me even greater honor and comfort me once again. Life, honor, comfort. They're in, they're in orange, so you know that's more things that can be restored to us. Restore life, honor, and comfort. So we don't have to be ashamed. We have honor that's coming our way. And comfort, isn't that, like that doesn't seem like a big deal to put in there with life, right? 
but it is because we live in a fallen world and some things happen. But God is there with us the whole time. Even when we get knocked down, he's there, oh, honey. He doesn't yell at us for getting knocked down. He's like, oh, honey, let me help you back up. Let me comfort you. You lost somebody, you lost something. It says we're supposed to mourn with those who mourn. And then joy is coming in the morning. We're not going to stay, stay there with them forever. We're going to help them and bring them out of that place of sorrow and distress and sadness and tell them that there's a better life that has been paid for by God. In this season, it's a little bit easier, too, because people at least normally know what Christmas means to Christians. They normally know that it's a day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And so we just have to take them from Jesus to Easter, from Christmas to Easter. And, you know, a couple sentences. You can do it. It's good. Okay, this, I don't know if you've heard it before, but it may rock your world. So take a breath. <sighs> Exhale. Sin entered the world through Adam. Many of us just hope, wish that Adam never sinned because then we wouldn't have the sin, the sickness, the death, the disease, the separation from God that we had because Adam sinned. So if that is true, then everything that I've said up to this point, although true, wouldn't be complete unless I share with you this. We have a better covenant with God than what Adam did. Sin came in, but we are in a better place now. And here's the part that's going to blow your mind. God is in a better place with us after redemption from sin. And I'll tell you why. Adam was a created being, but you and I are now sons of God. That's different. That's different. You come into my house, not as CJ, you don't get the benefits of CJ. You come into my house as, a fr as somebody who is somebody who's in my church. I will love you, but I'm not sure. You're not getting all CJ's benefits. And that's how it is with God. We are the sons of God. We are heirs according to the promise at this point. We, God breathed breath into Adam for life, but now we have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. We, don't, we can't hide from God, neither could Adam, but we can't hide from God. There is no separation anymore. Now we are close we have a closeness that Adam did, even Adam didn't have. Adam, God gave the earth. Now, through redemption, we have both heaven and earth. We are not just bound to this earth. The only death, if you're a Christian, the only death you've ever died, that you will ever have to die, is was taken care of. Now, you are an eternal being, and you will live, after you're finished with your time here on earth, then you'll live forever in heaven. To Adam, God is a, just a creator. To us, he is our dad, our father. Okay, here's a big one. So if Adam never sinned, and if he had, there were more people that came onto the earth, then we, were, we would always, even if sin never even happened until today, then we would always just be on the edge of losing our communion with God as close as it was for one person to mess up. But now, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry, am I going to be separated from God? Am I not going to be separated from God? What if Pastor Mary sins today? What if today is the day and all of humanity is now doomed? We don't have to worry about that. And why? Because now we live free without fear based on Jesus' finished work of the cross. Amen. Praise God. So he knew we were going to mess up. And he said, I get it. I know who you are. I see who you are. I love you anyway. And here, take this gift of redemption. Take this gift of salvation. And you no longer have to be worried and stressed about losing it because you can't lose it. Because it's not based on you. It's based on the perfection of my son and on the blood that was shed for you. That is true freedom. True freedom in this case is not even that you don't sin. True freedom is the fact that even if you did, you still walk in righteousness with God, which is opposite of what so many churches teach. So many churches teach that you have to walk in righteousness, and righteousness means that it is right doing. It is not right standing. And we are in right standing with God, regardless of the doing. 
But the beauty of it, and the beauty of knowing that for sure and in yourself, is that when you know that you are loved, and you know that you're not condemned, and you know that it's based on you, then all that sin, all that wrongdoing just falls off. We've had it backwards the whole time. It's not fix the thing. It's not fix the person. It does not take care of what you see on the outside, and then the inside will be pure. It is knowing that the inside is pure, and then all the stuff that's on the outside matches what's on the inside. We've had it backwards our whole lives. In Romans 5, and I'm going to read, look, a Bible. So I have a lot of Bible on PowerPoint. Today I'm reading from Romans 5, and it's one of the, we're in Romans in our Thursday night Bible study. If you can get here on a Thursday night, do it. It is fun. We start it back this week. It is good times. So in Romans 5, 15, through the end, I'm not going to tell you how long that is, but don't go to sleep. It talks about the difference between Adam and Jesus and what happened and how much better it was. This is a spoiler alert. How much better it is because we have Jesus, it's better than what happened with Adam. Just listen to what Listen to what is said here. There is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin, <clears throat> but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace, restoration, God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through the other man, Jesus Christ. That's better, right? I say that's better. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater restoration, godly restoration, over and above. But even greater is God's wonderful grace. And the gift of his righteousness for all who receive it and live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Even greater. Yeah, Adam's Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone who receives it. Because one man, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. So God's law was never made to make you right. God's law was never made, it says it right here, was never so that you could find out what was right and then do what was right. No, it was so that you could see how sinful that you were. But as people sin more and more, because that's what the law does, the law makes you sin more and more. As people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became even more abundant. Praise God. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow. Wow. We live in a good time in history, don't we? Uh, Post-cross, what is it that we can't do? After the cross... What is it that you can't do? You are redeemed and you have restoration that's coming your way. What is it? What is it that man can do unto you? I said that last week. I might just say it every week. What, 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 what can mortal man do to you when you have promises like this? Now, the question is, how do we position ourselves for this restoration? Just like many things in the Bible, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy. Let's go back to Psalms 23, 3. 23, 2 through 3. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me by, beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is a beautiful picture of what a shepherd does for his sheep. What God does for us. What Jesus did for us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means that there is no lack. There is no lack in your life. Regardless of what it looks like, there is no lack in your life. It is available to you. It is available to you. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. To lie down, that's rest. Your part is to rest. Green pastures, that talks about food, nourishment. He leads me beside the still waters. That word still means rest. He talks about it throughout. 
Now here's what I like. If you look at how the scripture, how I have it written out here, he leads me, he restores me, and he leads me. It's like he leads, he leads you to restoration. It's a restoration sandwich. If you're hungry, if you're upset, take your restoration sandwich and you'll be fine. He leads me, he restores me, and he leads me. That's powerful. And it's written in plain sight, and it has been the whole time. Most, of, most many, even non-believers, can quote the 23rd Psalm. He leads you, he restores you, and he leads you. What's your part? To rest and to be led. That's it. It's not hard. Because he gives you the food, he gives you the rest, he gives you the green pastures, he gives you a place to, to hang, he gives you water. You just, you're led, you're restored, and you're led. It's such a beautiful picture. You're led, you're restored, and you're led. Beautiful, beautiful. Esther 9.1 says, so on March 7th, I don't know what translation I took this from, but I just think it's funny that it says on March 7th because normally it's really much more Bible-y. And it says on the fifth day of the seventh month of the tenth year. But on March 7th, the two <laughs> decrees, just things that go through my head. I should have slept more. So on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. Oh, wait. But quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. So I have a question. What thought that it would have rule over you this year? In the Bible, it says that the Jews hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. So what wanted to have power over you this year? Because we have a scripture right here that says, oh, no, no, no. But you will have power over what tried to overpower you. Praise the Lord. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to dread about it. Was it, what was it? Was it debt? Was it worry? Was it anxiety? Was it health concerns? Was it isolation? What tried to overpower you this year? You are overpowering it this. You are overpowering whatever it was, even this day. That's the Kim's translation, based on the word of God. God is turning it around, but you call restore. Whatever it is that you see, stress, worry, lack, whatever it is, you call restore. And the enemies will take care of themselves because they tried to overpower you, but through God, you overpower them. In Jeremiah 30, 16, it says in the Amplified, it says, Therefore, all who devour you will be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, will go into captivity, and they who despoil you will become a spoil, and all who prey upon you, I will give for prey. He's serious. God is serious. Whatever comes against, and you know what? You know that's true because there's that part inside you. If you've had a sister, a brother, a child, a husband, a wife, somebody that you've ever cared about and something ever came against your people, it's one thing to do something to me, but it's something entirely different to come against my family. I feel like this. So at least I know that that part of me is from God. <laughs> oh, you think you're going to mess my kid up? Oh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I'll mess you up today. <laughs> As it is called to, while it is still called today, <laughs> you will rue the day that you came against. <laughs> An Incan house. In the Bible, let's go back there. <laughs> In the Bible, you know the story? You do know the story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The story in the Bible, about Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. Ruth is the, um, <laughs> Ruth is, so there are types and shadows in the Bible, right? And so Ruth is a type of us. That was the daughter, that was the, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi is a type of Israel. So Ruth decided to go with Naomi, even though she had no legal obligation, I don't think she, Ruth, um, Naomi said, oh, you don't have to come with me because they had both lost their husbands. She was going back to her homeland. It is a beautiful story of God's provision. Ruth had went to get provision for her and for her mother-in-law. 
And in that time, she met up with, and on the land, the person who owned the land, his name was Boaz. Boaz is a type of Christ to us. So in types and shadows in the Old Testament that bring us to the New Testament, right? So what happened was Ruth is taking advice from Naomi, okay? And Naomi is talking about, because it's at a time in their relationship that Boaz is, looks like he's going to propose, right? And so Ruth is like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, what's, what is it that I'm supposed to do here, Naomi? Give me some advice. So Ruth, it says in Ruth 3.18, it says, Then she, which is Naomi, said to Ruth, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. The man, Boaz, will not rest until he has concluded the matter, even this day. If you translate and meditate on it, so you've got, this is where, and I, I um, listened to a sermon from Joseph Prince about this, and he's, he actually, it's preached a lot right now, but have you heard people say specifically this, that when we rest, God works, and when God works, then we rest? And this is where he got it from. And I did not know where it originated, but I've heard many people teach it. But this is the scripture that he got it from. Because if you, ta- if you translate it, then you have, the, there's, what, what Naomi is saying to us is, you sit still while Boaz takes care of it. So we sit still while Jesus takes care of it, while Christ takes care of it. So our job is to rest. His job is to take care of it. And it will, the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. And that comes exactly from the scripture. When you work, God does not need to because you're doing it all yourself. And when we rest, then God is working. But when we rest, because we just saw in Psalms how it says that he leads us, we rest, and he leads us right? So in that time of rest, we are getting information from God about what it is that we're supposed to be doing. But when you're doing things in rest and not in works, then it's easy. I'm busier in the last six months than I've been in my entire life. But I'm more at rest in the last six months than I've been my entire life. If you would look at my schedule now compared to what it was a year ago, it is vastly different. Because you, I thought I was busy then. But did you know that right now, I am at more peace and rest than I've ever been because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, what God has led me to do at this time in my life. I can get more stuff done than someone half my age with half to do and more than I did when I was half my age and I had stuff to do because rest is not an activity. Rest is waiting on God and doing what God told you to do. That's what true rest is. He tells you, hey, I've got this. I'm going to work this out. Don't you worry. Don't you fret. You stand on the promises that I told you to and just believe. that We have got the easy part. He has the entire tapestry of the world that he will work out for your benefit. And all you have to do is know what it is and stand for it and believe. And that's, that's the easiest part that there is. And then don't try to get into works. But when he tells you to do something, then you do it. But it's so easy when he tells you. It's so easy. But what are we going to do? We're going to look at what needs to be restored in our lives. We're going to identify what was taken from us. Was this God or was this the devil? Well, run it through John 10.10. If it was good in life, then it was God. And if it was bad in the devil, sickness, disease, that's, that's of the devil. That's easy. And then we're going to say, oh, wait, 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 since that was taken from me, oh, God, restore, restore, restore. That's what we're going to do, restore whatever it is. It's the easiest prayer that there is. It's a declaration. We're not begging God to do what he already promised that he would do. No, we have to declare some things, identify and declare. That's the easy part. And then what we're going to do we're going to talk, we talked today about restoration, right? Right there in the word of restoration is the word rest. 
We're just going to rest. We're going to sit still and see how the matter will conclude even this day. In the middle of that word, there's the T, like the cross. We're going to rest in what God has done, what Jesus did for us at the cross. The redemption that he gave us from the cross. The thing that we were separated from God in whatever area of our life. Because did you know that whatever area that you see lack in, it's really just a separation from God and his perfect plan in that part of your life. Things happen and it's not, it's not necessarily, things happen in life and it's not necessarily because you did something. It's sometimes it's just because we live in this world. So I'm not saying if you have a lack in your life that it is something that is something on you. I'm saying that is your fault. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is now that this has happened, it is what do you do with it? What are you going to do? What are you going to say about it? What are you going to call the thief? What are you going to call restore? What are you going to rest in the perfect work that was done at the cross and rest in the blood of Jesus that covers not only your sins, but your life for your protection, for your prosperity, for all that he went to the cross to pay for you. But it can sit there just like money in a bank. If you never claim it, then it'll just sit there. And that's not what he meant for it. Meant that's not what he died for. That's not what he paid for. He paid so that you could have life and have life more abundantly and that you could be restored above and beyond whatever you could ask or think and ultimately live in heaven on earth, right? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this year that we've had. We thank you, Lord, for 2021, the lessons that we have learned, the time that we have gotten closer to you, the things that we know now that we did not know then that we have revealed to us through your word. And Lord, even today, the things that we have learned today, we can better identify the things that come from you and the things that come from Satan. And we know that we can do that because of your word, because you've laid it out so simply and easily for us. And we thank you for that. And Father, I just declare over the people that are here today and the people that are listening that you are a God of restoration. And I thank you that the things that we have lost that seem to be beyond something that can ever be repaid, but we thank you that you are the God that is more than enough and that you have come and you sent your son to die for us to pay and to get back more than what it was that we ever lost. And we thank you, Lord, for that restoration that's happening even now, even as we speak and as we go through to the next year, through 2022, that it is abundantly clear what it is we are supposed to do, how it is we are supposed to act, what it is, the, the knowledge of who we are in you and what you have provided for us becomes so clear, so crystal clear to us that we know that there is not one thing on this earth that we cannot do because you are with us. You are our strength. You are our strong tower. You are a protector. You are our dad. And there's nothing that you've called us to do that you will not do, that you will not equip us for and get us ready for and be with us every step of the way. And we thank you for those goals and those visions and those dreams being restored, being renewed, the sense of purpose that we have, the sense of love for your people that's being even reignited even as we speak today. Because that's why we're here. We're here to be your hands and your feet. We're here to show people the love that you gave to us unconditionally. And that's what we're here. We're here to show that to your world. And we thank you. We thank you for that we are born in this time, that we are here in this time. We thank you that you, in all of eternity, in all the years that the earth has been and will be, that you chose for us to be here today, together, in your house, that you chose for us to be in this time in our families, to be lights to them, and the world to be a light to the dying world, to show them that there's a better way that is not full of condemnation, and to be a, that you're a God to be scared of, that you're a God to be loved because you first loved us. And we thank you. We thank you for being a good daddy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.